my name is Patrick Spiro, and I'm a librarian at the American Philosophical Society, and I'd like to welcome you all to our lunch at the library. Um, it's a great opportunity for you all to have some food while we have some conversation. <laughs> um, but I want to make just a few uh, announcements. Um, so first of all, uh, you're in Franklin Hall, um, but this is lunch at the library. And if you're not familiar with our library, uh, I would encourage you all to learn about us and what we hold. Um, the society has over 14 million pages of manuscripts, over 300,000 books, thousands of hours of audio and visual, and we have a library hall just across the street. And if you haven't had a chance to see the inside of library hall, I encourage you to join us on one of our treasures tours. Uh, we offer treasures tours uh, um, to, to friends of the society, and uh, we also get to display our treasures in our museum exhibition across the street. And I want to let everybody know about our next museum exhibition, which is opening on March the 31st. It's called Pursuit and Persistence, 300 Years of Women in Science. And we've excavated from our collections the stories of pioneering female scientists spanning from the Enlightenment to the present day. And so that's opening to the public on March 31st. But if you're a friend, there's a special preview on March the 30th. So if you're interested in becoming a friend and getting access to the preview and to treasure stores, please check out information on the Friends program online. Uh, a couple other upcoming events. Uh, next Thursday, we have an evening uh, lecture uh, John Wood Sweet is talking about this, uh, the, the sewing, uh, sewing Girl's Tale, which just won the Bancroft Prize. The Bancroft Prize is an award given to the best book in history, and this just received it. Um, so that's uh, next Thursday evening, 6 o'clock here in Franklin Hall. And then our exhibition again opens on March the 31st, and I hope to see you all either at the lecture, at the opening, both, uh, or, uh, and also at our next lunch at the library. So today, uh, we're hosting Rebecca Cypress, who's a uh, professor at Rutgers in music and also an associate dean. Um, Rebecca, we like to say we like to make history come alive. <laughs> and uh, Rebecca's laughing because I think she knows what I'm going to say next. <laughs> Rebecca does make history come alive um, through her work uh, in music, but also as a historian. And I'd encourage you, if you haven't yet, to check out her CD. Um, she is the director and founder of the Raritan Players, and she's put together the Salon of Madame Brion. Many of the compositions, if not all the compositions, for this are, reside at the APS library. Is that correct? Some of the ones by Brion. Too. Right, yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, so uh, she does make history come alive in music, um, so we all can experience what the 18th century was like. But she also makes it come alive in her writing. And here we're to talk about her book that came out just recently, Women in Musical Salons in the Enlightenment. So thank you, Rebecca, for joining us. Thank you, Patrick. And I just want to say, you know, the APS feels um, like a second home, mm -hmm. um, in a sense, especially for all the, the scholarly work and the performances that I've done. You've supported my work over the years in so many ways um, that I'm very grateful and really glad to be here today to celebrate some of this with you. Yeah, I have to say that we have learned so much because of the work you've oh, done. Thank you. Um, you, you, you talked about uh, Brion's uh, compositions being known but neglected, if mm. I remember correctly. Do you want to tell us a little bit about why you think they were so neglected? Sure. I mean, she is someone who has been kind of on the periphery of histories, both kind of general history and music history for a long time. Um, you probably know that, well, you know, um, and I'll tell everybody, um, her collection of original musical compositions um, came to the APS in the 1950s because of her association with Benjamin Franklin. The APS acquired those um, composition manuscripts um, in the 1950s, and they kind of sat for a long time. Um, in the 1980s and early 90s, a musicologist named Bruce Gustafson um, came to the APS and cataloged her compositions. So that was kind of step one. I think in, in coming to understand, um, you know, what she wrote, what she accomplished, um, and, you know, obviously the work of people like me owes a lot to that, um, that preliminary um, bibliographic work that, that people like Gustafson um, do. Um, so uh, a lot of, you know, I, I owe gr a great debt, you know, to, to Bruce's work. Um, and 
then I think that people didn't really know what to do with her compositions. Um, if you think about Madame Brion in the context of musical developments in the second half of the 18th century, um, she seems like a little bit of an anomaly. Certainly, people viewed her as a curiosity, um, and we could talk about why, especially maybe because of the instruments that she used and the kinds of aesthetic approaches that she took to those instruments. But, you know, I, th I think for many decades, even centuries, um, people have listened to music from the late 18th century, thinking about Haydn and Mozart and early Beethoven, and thought, well, you know, this, this woman composer, you know, it, it's cute that she composed, but really this is not kind of deep or serious music that needs to be taken seriously. And I think that one thing that a feminist approach to history and to musicology can do is to try to meet um, these figures, figures like Madame Brion, um, along with other women composers, but also many musical women who did not compose, to meet them on their own terms um, and to ask what were the kind of aesthetic frameworks uh, within which they operated, what access did they have to musical education, why did they compose, what motivated them to do so, um, and that leads to a different set of, just asking the different questions yields a different set of answers. And so that's the approach that I've tried to take. You know, that's great. And as we know, Brion was a host of salons, so mm -hmm. I didn't know if you could tell us a little bit about what an 18th century salon really was like. Uh, but also in your book, and in, in your answer just now, you talk a lot about how there were sites for female cultural empowerment. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you could talk a little bit more, not just about salons, but how they were these sites for cultural empowerment. Yeah, it's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, you wrote a um, whole book about it. A whole book, yes, indeed. <laughs> Which you all should buy afterwards. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so, um, in the 18th century, the word salon meant a room, right? It meant a, a parlor, a living room, sometimes very elaborate, very ornate, um, but a physical space. Um, later, in the 19th century, is when the phenomenon that we'll call a salon came to be called by that term. Um, in the 18th century, they could be called a rout, a party, uh, in Spanish, a tertulia, in French, they could be known as a ruelle, um, or an assemblé, an assembly. Um, uh, in Italian and English, they were referred to as a conversazione or conversation. So there are all sorts of terms that are used for these events, but they were um, regular, often weekly events. Actually, we know that Benjamin Franklin spent twice a week at Madame Brion's salon while, while, the, while he was in Paris. He was her neighbor in Paris. Um, but they would meet weekly. Um, they often had a woman at their center. So a woman would be the salon hostess or salonniere, um, and she would welcome into her home people with whom she was already acquainted. They could be um, uh, sort of the local, you know, neighborhood elite. They could be artists. They could be intellectuals. They could be professional class musicians, people who lived locally, people who visited from abroad. Um, and so there was a lot of kind of traffic through these gatherings. Um, you know, a lot of ideas that flowed into the salon because of that international presence and also out of the salon. Um, so a woman who, like Madame Brion, was kind of restricted from full participation participation in public life would bring public life or aspects of public life into her home in this kind of ornate, beautiful environment of the salon um, or the, like, the physical space of the salon. And in that space, she could both gain an education and educate others about, right, informally, in an informal education, and educate others informally about her own views and her own positions and her own creativity. Um, so for someone like Franklin, who actually supported women's salons in Philadelphia, in London, in Paris, he was an advocate of women's education, he viewed the salon as a space for women to kind of encounter ideas that they might otherwise not have access to. Um, and Brion certainly um, participated in that. She was host to um, intellectuals and, and artists, philosophers, um, and musicians, composers from around um, um, the European continent and also um, from America. Um, so because of that kind of intermediate space, right, the salon occupied this intermediate space, 
between the public sphere and the fully private sphere. It was a site that women at the center of the salon could use to kind of promote and share their ideas, which again then flowed back out through the salon by way of her visitors and her friends. Um, so that's the idea of like the women as cultural agents within the salon. Now, one of the things I love about your book is how each chapter is focused on an individual and her salon, and how each salon was the space for her empowerment, and each one was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. It provides a different window into the th things that were happening in salons, one of which happened here in Philadelphia, yeah. Elizabeth Graham. Yeah. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the salons that were also happening on the other side of the Atlantic? Because we often think about France, but it really was a phenomenon that crossed the, uh, the ocean. Sure. So um, I'm going to wing this a little bit. So Elizabeth <laughs> Graham, um, right, she had a... a a home on Chestnut Street. The home doesn't stand anymore, but her family's um, country residence um, in Horsham, Pennsylvania, you can still go and visit, um, which I, right before the pandemic, I brought my daughter there. Mm. I was like, look, this is, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> visit a historic house right yeah. before the <laughs> shutdown. Um, so Elizabeth Graham traveled as a young woman before her marriage. She traveled to Britain, and she apparently um, visited the literary salons um, in London and, um, in, and elsewhere in Britain. And she had family in Scotland, so kind of along the way, she stopped by the Litchfield salons um, and encountered some of the, uh, the literary luminaries of, um, of Great Britain. Um, and when she returned, um, she began hosting a salon on Saturday nights in her family's um, Chestnut Street house. Um, and Benjamin Rush was part of her circle. Um, Annis and Richard Stockton were part of her circle. But also um, professional musicians. Um, uh, uh, sorry, James Bremner was one of them. So Bremner was a Scottish musician, one of many Scots who moved to Philadelphia. So there was this kind of rich um, mixing of Scottish and, uh, and New World, right, into intellectualism and artistry. Um, and she, uh, Elizabeth Graham was also friends with Frances Hopkinson, right, the signatory of the Declaration, but also a very accomplished amateur musician um, who interacted with Bremner and apparently studied music with Bremner. Um, she owned a harpsichord. Hop Har Hopkinson arranged for her to have a harpsichord sent on board a ship from London to um, uh, uh, to Philadelphia, so she owned an English instrument here. Um, and her salon was one in which literature and music and politics and other kind of int intellectual themes would be, um, would be regularly discussed. That's great. And then there's an interesting Franklin connection with her, yeah. uh, which you hint might have spurred her own artistic creativity. Can you share that with us? So at, at one point, she was um, engaged, maybe informally, maybe more formally, it's not really clear, but to William Franklin, um, Benjamin's son. Um, and he apparently broke off the engagement, but she was actually composing poetry long before, okay. uh, long before then. So um, yeah, so just sort of encountering her poetry, which is um, housed at the Library Company of Philadelphia and the Historical Society of Philadelphia, sorry, the Library Company of Pennsylvania and the Historical Society of Philadelphia. Um, those collections house um, her original poetry. They actually are infused with a musicality, sometimes in very concrete terms. She'll actually say, this poem is designed to be sung to the tune of, and then she gives the name of a common tune. So you can kind of reconstruct um, what her poetry might have sounded like when sung aloud. And that's one thing that um, my collaborators and I were able to do um, as part of this this book project, there is a website that has, I don't know, 25, 30 audio examples, some of which are on the published CDs, but others of which are just illustrations of some of the musical practices that, um, that I discuss in the book. Um, so one of those uh, is, you know, a kind of... Uh, a couple of those are, are renditions of poetry from the Salon of Elizabeth Graham as it would have been sung to popular tunes, um, generally Scottish folk songs. So That's great. So I, I, I would like to do a thought experiment with you. Okay. Uh, imagine <laughs> if we could travel back in time and we're visiting Franklin uh, Station just outside of Paris with Brian being his close neighbor, and he said, tonight I'm going over to Madame Brian's house.
What would we expect in that evening? Right. Well, he he described uh, these evenings chez Madame Brion um, when he wrote to um, William Carmichael, uh, an American diplomat. Um, so he explained that he visited Madame Brion twice a week. Um, that she and her daughters would entertain him. I'm not going to get the quote exactly right, so bear with me. But with a dish of tea, a game of chess, um, and some songs which they sing very prettily. Um, so. So you know there there would have been um, there would have been game playing right chess as well as I think games like proverbs which. Uh, that was a whole rabbit hole that I dove <laughs> down, and like, I could talk about the game of Proverbs at length too, but I'll spare you for the moment. Um, and uh, so, so there was game playing, there was food and drink, right? He talks about tea, um, and then music, right? And so in her home, um, she seems to have collected um, not just kind of ordinary instruments, utilitarian instruments, but she was a real collector of different instruments that seemed to show her actually embracing new technologies. Um, so we have this, this portrait up here by um, the great uh, Rococo artist Jean-Honoré Fragonard. Um, and if you look in the lower left corner, it may be hard to see, or like lower left corner behind her, behind her right hand, um, it looks like there's a kind of box, a wooden box there. And it's also in the portrait on the, on the cover of the CD, so you could study it when the light is better, I don't know. Um, but what that is, is a square piano. It's called a, an English square piano. Um, these were instruments that had just really been invented. The, the English builder, he was actually a German immigrant named Johannes Zumpe, or Zumpi, um, he came over to England, um, in the, I think in the 1760s, early 60s, and he developed this mechanism for creating a piano. Um, the French did not really have, at that point, um, a tradition of piano building. This was all very new, right? They were very, they prided themselves on their long tradition of harpsichord building, but it's a different technology, both keyboard instruments, but it's a different technology inside. So while the harpsichord plucks strings, the piano hammers strings, and that's what creates the sound. And the great advantage of the piano, or so people in the 18th century thought, was that you could control the volume level or the dynamics of the instrument using finger pressure alone. So if you played a note with greater force, it would sound loud, loudly, and if you played it with a lighter force, right, it sounded soft. Um, so Madame Brion owned, we know that she owned, uh, a harpsichord, probably a French instrument. She owned this English square piano, um, and she owned also a German piano, probably something kind of like a wing-shaped instrument, sort of like the modern piano or like a harpsichord. So she owned at least three instruments, and we know that she owned all three because she composed music for all three, um, probably for herself to play together with her two daughters. Keyboard instruments were among the instruments that were socially acceptable for women to play. They were not supposed supposed to play loud instruments, they weren't supposed to play wind instruments, they weren't supposed to play violins or cellos, which were the domain of professional musicians who showed themselves off on stage inappropriately, or again, so, so the, social norm, uh, the social norms of the time held. So playing keyboard instruments was a w and singing, these were ways that women could be musically expressive. So Madame Brion said, well, okay, I have a little bit of extra money. She did. She had plenty of money. Um, so she said, OK, I'm going to take full advantage of that association between women and girls and keyboard instruments, and I'm going to collect all of them. And not only that, but we also know that Benjamin Franklin gave her a glass harmonica. Um, and yeah, so it's, and he talks about pl hearing her. Or, there's a letter where he kind of imagines himself in heaven with Madame Brion. Uh, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Some of these letters are very risque, let me tell you. Um, classic Franklin. Yeah. Um, but he envisions, um, I think that he, he talks about how maybe he will have enough time at that point to practice enough that he could play duets with her, duets for the, the piano and the glass harmonica together. Um, she probably also, she played the harp. We know that she composed at least one piece that it includes harp. Um, and I think that this English square piano, she particularly favored because she could make it sound like a harp. Mm. Um, it had pedals, 
So sustain pedals, which make the sound kind of keep ringing.、Um, and actually, when she was visited by this English music historian Charles Burney, right, he had heard of her and wanted to hear music in her salon. So he visited her. He said she's a good composer. She plays very well. She can sight read music excellently. But I, you know, I couldn't get her to stop using these pedals. And from his perspective, he said something like, "It sounds,、um, it's, it's like the, oh, tis like the sound of bells, continual and constant."、Hmm. So for him, the pedals made the the sound kind of all blurry and everything rang together. And she loved that. And part, I think, partly because it was almost like this harp, harp-like quality,、um, and so she really wrote music in that way.、Um, and for for、um, uh, Bernie, Charles Bernie, the music historian, he thought, well, this is like kind of tasteless.、Mm-hmm. Um, but that also shows how she's using her own taste to shape the music in in her in her home and her environment. Well, that actually opens up a question I've really wanted to ask you, which is, as both a historian and a musician yourself. Um, how does that background inform your own interpretation of the past?、Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah, for me,、um, putting music into practice is a form of research,、mm-hmm. um, and it helps to shape my thinking about. Um, all these women, but I think especially in this book,、um, this information about Madame Brion's、um, performance practice at at her instrument and the fact that sh- this was clearly this instrument was her favorite, right? She had her portrait painted with it. That means something.、Um, And looking also at her manuscripts and seeing how she really uses the ped, the, the sustain pedal very liberally,、um, it sort of allows for an immersion in her musical aesthetics in a way that you don't get just by reading the scores silently. So actually, that that idea. I hope it's okay to say this. The idea that she's imitating the harp with this English square piano is、um, something that. I kind of came to through that、mm-hmm. act of recreation and trying to actually hear what the music sounds like. If I take Bernie's criticism, not as a criticism, but like an opportunity, but、yeah. to take it seriously and try to try to recreate that. I should also mention that I was incredibly blessed as part of this project、um, to receive on long-term loan. A 1780 English square piano.、Um, it's living in my house right now.、Um, it's on loan from、um, uh, someone named Leslie Martin, who purchased it in Paris in the 1960s.、Um, he didn't have a use for it at the time, and so in, he knew that I was working on. How he knew is a long story, but he knew that I was working on this recording and.、Um, Delivered it to me in New Brunswick, which is wild,、um, and I still can't believe. I have to pinch myself. I can't believe that happened. <laughs> well, that, that's a question I've always wanted to ask, and I've wondered about, which is、um, specifically, why did something like the Glass of Marnica, which I've heard played、mm. and can be very moving,、mm. really fall completely out of fashion? Or、uh, certain instruments, like the、uh, piano you're talking about now, no longer find its use? Like, why?、Yeah. Why did I,、uh, taste shifts or, or even you shift? That's so. It's such a such an interesting and and complicated story.、Um, the glass harmonica has a kind of very sp- specific, s- strange history that's been tracked by、um, other music historians,、um, Annette Richards, Heather Hadlock, among others,、um, who. Kind of describe its its meteoric rise、yeah. right around the 1770s, 1780s.、Um, it's this very very fashionable instrument. It sounds otherworldly.、Mm-hmm. It's it's、uh, it seems to encapsulate the human voice in a very、um, kind of mesmerizing way. In fact, mesmer. Himself, I say that, and I, I should also <laughs>、yeah. add, Mesmer himself seems to have used the glass harmonica as part of his kind of、uh, seances or like these、okay, hypnoses.、Mm. But he would do those specifically on women,、mm. um, and and the instrument came to be associated with women's voices and、um, women's sorry, women's hysteria, right? To use a, a kind of a dated term,、um, but in a way. That led to its the instrument's downfall.、Um, it became、mm-hmm. it was no longer kind of seen as this kind of pure representation of the human voice or some kind of otherworldly sound. It took on this very negative connotation because it it became associated with、um, with 
with women. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, then map onto that. I mean, this, the story of this, this English piano is also very different. I think that in the modern age, you know, the historical performance movement, um, as far as pianos have gone, has been so... Uh, you know, strongly centered around Vienna and the story of Mozart mm -hmm. and that kind of canonic figure that everyone's making reproductions of, right, everyone, the piano mm -hmm. builders who are making reproductions of 18th century pianos are very often using Viennese, Viennese instruments as their model and the kind of ideal Mozartian instrument. So these English square pianos are very much on the periphery of the historical performance movement. Um, and there are very few of these English instruments from the 18th century that have been restored to playing condition. Um, many of them are kind of like, you'll, you'll find that actually Rutgers University owns one that I encountered when I first got there as a faculty member. This I instrument built by Muzio Clementi, um, who was a composer and impor important instrument builder in the 18th and early 19th centuries, completely unplayable. Mm. Um, it's, it's sort of a desk. It's a piece of furniture. It, it has no, no other purpose than that. It would need a full like rebuild in order order to become playable. Um, so the, the, that, uh, mentioning Mozart, the 18th century is this dynamic period, just changes in science and politics and society, yeah. but also in music. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what music was like in the 18th century and the streets in the symphonies, uh, but also how the salon fits into that story? Yeah, yeah. Um, and Brion has, I think, a very interesting place in that story. So maybe I'll kind of focus my answer around that. But um, yeah, there's a lot going on. One of the major developments of the mid to late 18th century is the rise of the public concert. Um, that's something that, um, you know, started kind of in ceremonial ways earlier in the century, but in terms of public concert life, the way that we think about it where you buy a ticket and you attend on a, on a certain night, um, that's something that, that really happened in, in this period. So, you know, actually Franklin talks about how he doesn't like going to the opera in Paris. Um, he would much rather spend the evening in, in Madame Brion's home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, he, the, the, the kind of musical styles that are embraced in the public concert, big orchestras, you know, uh, virtuosic, singers who, you know, use all their, uh, their vocal fireworks to sh kind of show off. Um, he's not interested in any of that. He really wants the kind of, um, the more toned down simplicity of music in the, in the salon. Um, and that, quote, simple uh, approach is what Madame Brion tries to adopt. Um, there's nothing simple about it, but she's, a, she's pretending that it's natural, it's easy, it's gracious, it's, it's sort of um, not, it, you know, it avoids all of that vocal virtuosity or instrumental virtuosity that's associated more with the public concert. Um, you know, I think that the fact that she's embracing also some of the dynamics of, of folk song um, and that Franklin also really loved <laughs> Scottish folk songs, right? Think about, again, that Philadelphia-Scotland connection. Um, so that also kind of attests to the, the, the interest in music of the folk, music of the people. Now, what popular music, right, or vernacular music truly sounded like in the 18th century, I think we're still excavating, and we do that by means of um, kind of transcriptions of, quote, folk songs, but always with a bit of skepticism, because those quote, folk songs, the second that they were notated mm. and published, they're being notated for consumption by a different audience, right? By, for performance, sometimes by professional musicians, but often by, you know, for, for audiences that include the elite, the aristocrats, the, the nascent bourgeoisie and the, the middle class. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of dynamic. One really interesting thing about Madame Brion's compositions, especially the songs of which maybe we'll play an mm -hmm. excerpt in a, in a few moments, um, is that for many, um, for the vast majority of song compositions in this period, you would have a, a, a singer, right, whose line is written out, um, and often the, the, uh, the keyboardist is, is singing and self-accompanying. So in her salon, maybe Madame Brion would play, she would play the keyboard and have one of her daughters sing, but very often it's, it's meant to be that the singer self-accompanies on, on the keyboard. Um, but the right-hand part is almost never written out. Hmm. The right hand part is improvised according to the kind of harmonic language of the time. And this is something that Madame Brion would have been well versed in, so would her daughters. Everybody just kind of learned how to fill in the chords um, in order to self accompany at the keyboard. Um, but Madame Brion's song compositions, these two fat volumes of what she calls romance or romances, right, the kind of uh, po poetic romance of the time, um, 
she writes out these really lush right hand accompaniments,、mm -hmm. um, right hand parts that I think at the if I'm if I'm dating the songs correctly predate. Anything like that that appears in print or that appears、uh, as composed by male composers, and I think she does that partly because she's a harpist and she's trying to make the arpeggiation, the kind of the chords, the rolling chords of the English square piano sound like a harp.、Um, so she is doing that. She's kind of innovating. For her in her own compositions, in ways that are not happening in the public sphere, they're not happening in published music for the home. They're happening in her compositions, only in manuscript for her private circle.、Yeah. That's great. So the salon sound absolutely amazing to me. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to have been able to attend them, but they weren't. Popular necessarily in their own age. I, I was surprised at all the controversy that surrounded them. The Adamses, for instance. Oh、really. yes! Oh my gosh! So could you tell、yeah. us a little bit about the the, the criticisms of salons that also、yeah. existed in the 18th century? Well, I mean, I think one one thing to note is. From our 21st century perspective, they have this air of exclusivity、um, that is, I think, it grates on our modern sensibilities of inclusion.、Um, so they were exclusive spaces, and you know that doesn't mean that they're not worth studying. And I think that thinking about women's agency there, there's a kind of、uh, complex intersection of, of identity, social class,、um, you know, gender, and and all sorts of other kind of identity factors that I think we need to think about. So it's not. Like these were idyllic spaces in which everybody got along. No, these were exclusive spaces for predominantly、um, wealthy,、uh, you know, white people、uh, who lived in、um, lived in a state of privilege.、Um, and to the extent that they included、uh, lower class people, a professional class people,、um, it was as you know. Uh, those people were being patronized, right? The, the 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 elite would patronize or provide patronage to those、um, those lower class types.、Um, but yes, there there was a lot of controversy around salons because they had a kind of libertine reputation.、Um, and you, if you just kind of read the the correspondence between Franklin and Brion, which you can do by looking even just at the、um, the Yale collection of、um, uh, you know digitized、uh, Franklin papers. I think it's FranklinPapers.org. Mm -hmm. um, you can see、uh, they're talking about very risque things, indeed,、um, and you know, you know, like very, very flirtatious, but to the point of being like you know borderline explicit.、Um, Adams was shocked. John Adams、uh, and, and his wife Abigail came to dinner、uh, at the Brion home,、um, and I can't remember all the all the details of who was sitting on whose lap, but th、mm. there was a lot of that that was going on.、Um, and again, like you know, it, I you know, there, I think that that studies of the salon often kind of center that sensationalism,、um, and it's definitely interesting and odd, and、um, yeah. I, but I also think that we shouldn't let that. Reflect from the kind of intellectual and artistic agency that women like Brion are、um, are exercising in the salon. So it was some of both. <laughs> yeah, well, was the criticism then coming more because salons were these spaces where traditional gender expectations and norms were actually being crossed? Yeah, I mean, for in the Adams criticism, it's not clear to me if that is a criticism of the salon or if it's a criticism of France,、mm. right? So、uh, yeah. Adams is coming with this kind of. I thought you were going to say Franklin too, because he didn't like Franklin.、Either. Well, that also, <laughs> but you know, right, Franklin was obviously much more much more at home in the French yeah, yeah. milieu than、yeah. than the Adamses were. The Adams with their you know very kind of puritanical Massachusetts. I'm a Massachusetts person, but like for coming from their from their Massachusetts background,、um, you know, I think that and 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 a very British orientation. And obviously, Britain and France are at odds, and so there's all sorts of,、um, you know, kind of tensions, cultural tensions, and and tensions around social norms. Yeah. That yeah. But even Jefferson, who is the philosopher president,、uh, was. I assumed he'd be enamored with the salon culture, but in fact, was not. Well, it's interesting. When he was in France, he right, was, yeah, yeah. but he didn't want to bring it home and corrupt his wife and daughters.、Um, <laughs> but when he was in France,、uh, Jefferson was,、um, you know, very famously now、um, he.、Uh, Apparently had an affair with Maria Cosway,、um, who was also a salon hostess. She was also a composer、um, and a and a, a poet.、Um, so you know, she sort of、um, 
represented, I think, that, that ideal of French sociability. And for Jefferson, it was all well and good while he was on that side of the Atlantic, but mm -hmm. not something that he wanted to bring home to Virginia. Yeah, yeah. that's great. <laughs> we're, we're almost uh, out of time, but I didn't know if you wanted just to share with us one other story uh, from one of the women you study, Sarah Levy. Oh, or, sure. Uh, 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 Mar Maria uh, Martins. Yeah, I mean, Martins. gosh, there's so yeah. much to uh, to talk about. Yeah. But maybe I'll just I'll say a little yeah. bit about Sarah Levy yeah. because the APS provided me with a Franklin Research Grant to work with some of her um, some of her the manuscripts that she owned um, in Berlin in the summer of 2018. So yeah. I uh, that's a again a, another way in which. The APS is like embedded in this project. Um, so Sarah Levy was actually how I came into the study of salons in the first place. Um, she was a salon hostess and keyboardist, very virtuosic keyboardist, um, whose life spanned a very long period. She lived to the ripe old age of 93 um, in Berlin. Um, she was uh, from a Jewish family and clung to her Jewish identity throughout her life, while many people in her family family and her social circle were converting. Um, she was also the great aunt, she be later became the great aunt of Felix Mendelssohn, um, so she's part of that, uh, that family and that musical heritage. But basically when Mendelssohn um, in 1829 uh, encountered um, the library collection of the Zing Academy, the Singing Academy um, in Berlin, he studied there, and he, he would have encountered among the sources um, these materials that I got to work with um, in summer 2018, which were owned by Sarah Levy. Um, so she, um, she was a collector. She was not a composer herself, and she's, I think, one of those people who, um, or her, her circle was a circle that would have frowned upon women's authorship, especially upper-class women's authorship or, you know, wealthy women's authorship. It's to, to be an author, to be a composer, um, even for Felix's br uh, sister Fanny Mendelssohn, was considered like uh, artisanal work, almost like a seamstress. And, and you don't stoop to those things if you have aspirations to kind of high social standing. Um, so uh, Levy had to kind of assert her musicianship and her agency in a different way. Um, and I think that one of the ways that she did so was to assemble this massive collection of hundreds of scores, um, many scores from the Bach family. She actually was a student of Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, commissioned music from um, Wilhelm Friedemann, Carl Philipp Emanuel, um, and other members of the Bach family. She collected music by Johann Sebastian Bach, who had long since passed away. Um, but, um, but she kind of left her mark in the Bach tradition and transmitted that to Felix Mendelssohn, for whom Bach became a kind of important touch point um, and some, someone to whom Mendelssohn was constantly responding in his own work. Um, so, yeah, that's yeah. An, uh, just another case. No, that's great. Yeah. So you've uh, pulled some music for us to listen to to imagine ourselves in one of these salons. Sure. So I don't yeah. know if you want to do that while we get the microphones out and can take a, a few minutes of questions as well. Sure. So, yeah. um, so Jeremy is going to help us with the first, uh, the first excerpt. This is one of Madame Brion's songs. Um, maybe we'll just listen to a few minutes of it. And if you'd like, you can listen for um, the way that the piano kind of sounds like a harp. And then if we have time, we'll listen to a piece that was dedicated to her by Luigi Boccherini, who visited her salon and says that he learned how to play the keyboard from her because she, he was a cellist. So anyway, let's listen to a song first. This is um, Viens m'aider au Dieu d'amour. Uh-oh. Hold, please. <laughs> Well, is there a question? Maybe we can take a question while they sure. get that loaded, if there are any questions. Renee? Um, so if you were a traveler, a, a female traveler from the United States, and you weren't in, already in correspondence with, with somebody um, <laughs> who had her salon in France, how would you, would you need to carry letters of introduction to that person? Mm. How would you receive entree to these exclusive 
salons? Yeah, first of all, you'd be, um, you, the, the question, the beginning of the question was if you were a female traveler from the United States and wanted to visit a salon. So one, you would, you would be an anomaly, right? Because female travelers don't travel. Well, there's no such thing as a sole female traveler, mm. except Elizabeth Graham. Um, she was, when she, she visited Britain, she was accompanied by a family friend who was m a much older man who was a local pastor. Um, and that was already an oddity. It was very strange. Um, but she was visiting family there, and so she would have received introductions to um, the salons that she wanted to visit from those family connections. We actually don't have a record of Elizabeth Graham about exactly how she gained entree into those, those um, gatherings, but the, the basic idea is that um, you either needed to be personally invited or you needed a credible connection um, you know, who, would bring you, um, who would bring you there. So, oh, I think do we have the music back. Yeah, <laughs> that wasn't about a no. singing about? Uh, oh. Come, O oh God of love, and help me to portray the, my beloved, right? Okay. The, the person that I, that I love. Um, so if, do we have a time yeah. just to hear a little bit of uh, this sonata by Luigi Boccherini? You can hear the same arpeggiation figures, this time in the left hand of the keyboard, um, but this is one of his violin sonatas dedicated to Brion. And what year was that done, the, the one that's dedicated? Uh, 1768. Okay. the point. <laughs> and you can listen to this on a CD, you know, you can think about that connection between Brion and, Boc and Boccherini, but um, yeah, that's, ju that's just to give you a taste. Oh, that's great. Any other questions? I'll get you next. Um, I was wondering if you could say... that before before it's committed to paper or is it something that she's working out on paper first and then kind of doing in the space so and if people can hear she was asking about the process by which she composed yeah the you know I, I think okay. compositional process is not something we have clear visibility into so I can talk about kind of generally how um, how composition worked in the 18th century and what I think based on the, the construction of her songs. Um, but like we don't have sketches, right, that, that help to elucidate compositional process in this case. So in the 18th century um, and 
in a lot of music, 17th, 19th, even 19th century, um, the foundation is the bass, right? The foundation is the, the low notes, which help to define the harmonic content. So for many composers, um, Mozart often included, the bass line and the melody come first, and then the inner parts, to the extent that there are inner parts, for example, in a string quartet, the inner parts get worked out later. Um, and I, you know that's not always true, but like as a broad generalization, I think that's pretty fair to say. So what happens in song compositions is, for the most part, um, the inner voices, right, the inner parts of the keyboard are basically left in completely skeletal form or sometimes not notated at all. And there was just a set of conventions. Um, sometimes they were, they were notated in what's called figured bass, which is like a system of numbers that appear under the bass line um, that help the player very loosely define what notes need to get played in order to make the harmony sound complete. Um, obviously, Brion, like, she, she understands the harmonic language, but what she's doing is saying, I'm not just going to leave this up to chance. I'm not going to leave it up to each performer or, like, my daughters to figure out how they want to realize these chords, make the chords complete on their own. Instead, she writes out these really complex figuration. Um, da 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 All those little notes get notated. Um, and that, again, is something that you generally do not see in, um, in printed songs of the period or even manuscript songs by male composers. You see it in her salon, I think, first. I think she's doing it before other people because she has in her mind this harp-like sound that she wants to capture and, um, and kind of dictate very specifically for her, um, her keyboard compositions. So there's a question online uh, specifically about Rousseau and whether or not Rousseau engaged with salons. <laughs> um, yeah, that's another, another kind of fraught question, and there's a lot of literature out there on Rousseau and salons. Um, I will say uh, that Rousseau had very mixed feelings about salons um, and about the um, kind of generally about um, this idea of women as cultural agents. Um, so in, if you, if you want to look in his... Um, his letter, um, oh gosh, it's the letter on Geneva. Um, that's where Rousseau writes a lot about the kind of place of women in, um, in, you know, in, in the public sphere uh, there. And, and he criticizes women who we would today, I think, define as salonniere or salon hostesses um, who seek to put themselves at the center of conversation and at the center of debates about, you know, issues and ideas that they really have no, they have no place in getting involved in. Um, at the same time, he attended salons. Yeah, so. No, here, yep, yep. She's had her hand up for a while. <laughs> Paris, <coughs> at the time of Madame Bion, was... Oh, you could really lean into the mic. ...was the height of the publishing world for music. Mm. Were any or many of her pieces published? No, mm -hmm. no. Um, so, no, she, she did not publish her musical compositions. I think she intended them um, as what I would call ephemerae, right? And, you know, there's a kind of library classification of ephemerae, but this, they, she really meant for these to be kind of um, ephemeral, uh, you know, things that, were, that would entertain and delight, but not something that she was looking to perpetuate in the public sphere. And she writes about this to Franklin as well. She writes about how she, she has a lot of talent and she has a, a lively mind, but she's gonna kind of reserve it for her, her intimate circle. Um, what's interesting though, is that some of the stories that Franklin wrote for her and maybe that he even collaborated with her on, he would later go on to translate, to print on his private printing press in Paris and disseminate among their circle in print, and then later to publish and circulate for broad consumption. So again, that's another way in which her ideas, or at least you know, her kind of inspiration and her mark on his work would have entered the public sphere through the, the, uh, the, the vehicle of publication. Thanks. How many romances or songs did uh, Madame Brion 
Right. It sounds it sounds like she wrote a lot. She wrote a lot. Um, I don't remember the exact number, but I would guess between forty and sixty. And again, they're in these two large so, yeah, large volumes. Yeah, but, I mean, before Schubert, uh, art song uh, really doesn't have a major place in the output of composers. I mean, certainly Mozart and Haydn wrote songs, but they're considered to be fairly minor part of their of their output. Uh, to what extent did the Salon itself lead to the, let's say, the recognition of art song? So, you know, I, I think it's true that Haydn and Mozart songs were generally, have generally been kind of relegated to second, secondary status in relation to their more public-facing music, symphonies, operas, etc. Um, at the same time, I don't know if they would have seen their songs as a kind of secondary secondary category of their output. Haydn wrote, wrote lots and lots of songs, including arrangements of Scottish songs, um, which he published while he was in London. Um, and there were lots and lots of collections of songs that were published between 1750 and 1800 that, that are only now starting to be kind of treated seriously. Um, so I think that she's part of that tradition, which has existed but flown under the radar um, for many decades in you know, music history and in, perf in the history of musical performance. Um, so I think that there's, there's a lot left to discover uh, and, and we're, we're only scratching the surface yet. Thanks, I think we have time for one last question. Oh. Yep. So I'm just curious, was there a pecking order of salons? Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, if you were um, uh, in hot demand, like Franklin, w was there competition among different salon purveyors to, you know, get the hot uh, guy showing up? That's very interesting. Um, I don't know if I have a firm answer to that, mm -hmm. or at least to the issue of, of competition for the, the kind of fashionable people. Um, but you would issue invitations, right, to someone like, like Franklin. Um, he, he certainly had those salons where he felt most comfortable, and he would, he would kind of come back again and again. The Lavoisiers are another, uh, another home, um, and Madame Lavoisier, right, the, um, the great chem chemist couple, um, so, and they were also musical, um, and so they would invite Franklin Franklin over, um, and they, you know, describe he, they, they describe having dinner with him and and a little bit of a little bit of music after dinner. Um, Madame Elvetius, obviously, also he was very much connected with. But there were the kind of big names of that, like the first generation of um, what I'll call Enlightenment salons. Uh, Madame Geoffrin, Madame Necker. Um, these were like I think the, the hottest names, um, and they were not necessarily musical, right? They were. I mean, they so Madame Geoffrin supported musicians and Mozart, a very little Mozart at the age of seven or something, performed in um, Madame Geoffrin's salon. Um, but, you know, there were... Uh, these these women didn't always have specially musical interests. So in terms of my pecking order, I was <laughs> I was really interested in in those salonier where um, either the salonier herself had a great talent for music and or you know or a lot. Of, we, there's evidence that a lot of her gatherings um, would have included music or featured music music prominently. Um, so I was looking for those cases where where music played a big role. Um, but there's really also no firm line separating musical and non-musical salons. Music was one of the many arts that were cultivated in salons. Um, and that includes those kind of super elite women like Geoffrin and Necker, as well as, um, you know, Madame Brion and, and many others. Well, Rebecca, it is about the end of the lunch yeah. hour. So I'd like to thank you for this conversation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And I think everybody has a copy of the CDs at your uh, table. Yes, feel uh, free. But also, uh, the books are available for sale in the back. Uh, again, it's a wonderful book, Women and Musical Salons in the Enlightenment. You had just a taste of it today. Uh, each chapter goes into it. It brings you really into a salon so you can hear and feel what it was like to be there. So thank you so much for all thank the work you. you've done. Thank yeah. you, Patrick. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>